we have to be clear in the first place, you know, why you want power, right? Because power is a very specific thing used in a very specific way, right? Like you have to like figure out like why you want power in the first place. If you have ambitions of like changing the world, changing organizations, making things better for everybody, then you need power. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the hard truths playbook you never got. I'm Michael Wenderoff, and you're listening to 97% Effective. Close your eyes. Imagine the opening scene in music of Game of Thrones. Rivalry, intrigue, power. And then doing a fashion walk-off in front of 60 people. Then debating if a blogger's scandal-laced strategy is an effective way to increase one's influence. That's what might greet you in the opening minutes of Professor Peter Bellamy's top rank MBA course, Paths to Power, which he teaches at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. But make no mistake, as entertaining as his courses might seem, Peter is a widely recognized management thinker on a serious mission. He wants to deeply challenge people's assumptions about what leads to success and influence. And he wants you to examine your worldviews and what you will or won't do in your careers. As he says, I study why rich people are rich, why poor people are poor, and why disparities between the rich and the poor tend to persist over time. Specifically, he looks at psychological forces, a topic we're going to get into, and the subtle ways that groups and institutions may reproduce hierarchies and inequity. I've invited Peter because I want to explore his creativity and his research focusing on practical ways aspiring executives can benefit from his insights. Peter, welcome to 97% Effective. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> so, so before we dive into to weightier topics, I want you to settle an ongoing discussion between my wife and I. She raves about Filipino food, and I've not exactly been bowled over. Now, now granted, she's worked and traveled there much more than me, and I'm willing to change my mind in the face of compelling evidence or information. And I know that you are proudly Filipino. So tell me how you'd go about changing my mind and, and perhaps in doing so improve my marriage. <laughs> All right. Well, let's begin with some basic questions, which is what kind of Filipino food have you had? The fact that I can't even name the exact food. <laughs> we were on vacations there and we lived in Asia. So you know, I'm always drawn to Thai food and Vietnamese food, which to me felt like they had a wider range in, of flavors. So, yeah, so that's, okay. that might be part of the problem that I can't name specific things. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is not, this sounds like a you problem then. <laughs> <laughs> you should yeah, be a coach. This, 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 this is, yeah, this, I don't know if this, yeah, I don't know if I can help you or your marriage, but there is some research showing that People come to like something the more they're exposed to it simply because they just try out the, that thing over and over again. Plus, like the, the good thing about Filipino food is that one thing to remember about it is that it's a very time intensive, uh, the, the preparation for Filipino food is very time intensive. And so it helps to be reminded that, oh my God, somebody like literally like went out of their way, took so much of their time out of their very busy day to prepare this food for me. And so, you know, helps to remember that that food was probably made with lots of love and attention and time for you. So even if you don't like it, you need to eat it up. <laughs> 
So I'm going to have to find, because I don't know if there's many good uh, Filipino restaurants in Madrid, but the repeated exposure and to, to give it a try, I need yeah. to eat some of my own medicine. I tell my son yeah. that all the time. He resists a lot of food. I mean, like it's it's funny that you say that because like, you know, as you're very familiar, like we were under the, the Spanish colony for for 333 years. And so do you like Spanish food? Oh, love it. Love it. Oh my yeah. God. Then you will love Filipino food because basically literally like everything that we know about cooking is basically from the Spaniards. And so, you know, we just made it better. So, yeah. yeah. So I have this feeling that my wife sent you a note in advance to, to put in that <laughs> plug for, for Spanish food as well. <laughs> the first question that I wanted to ask you, I, I found that you had this, there's the, the meat endowment has these uh, dream idea proposals. And you had proposed taking a group of your MBA students to see Hamilton. I understand because of the pandemic or that didn't get funded, it didn't happen. But it felt to me reading that proposal that that encapsulated a lot of what you're trying to do through your courses and you want to do through your research. Can you just share a little bit about <laughs> that idea? Yeah, well, I wish I, I wish there was more to that idea, <laughs> more than what you just said. But basically, to give your listeners some context, a couple of years ago, I got this fancy award from UVA, and part of the award came with a little cash prize. And the agreement was that I was going to use that cash prize to create an extraordinary experience for my MBA students. Full disclosure, I've ne- I didn't grow up in the U.S., and so I have very little knowledge of U.S. history. And all I know is that like everybody had been talking about Hamilton at that time. And so I was like, why not? And I was like, how am I going to be able to justify taking a bunch of MBA students to go see Hamilton? And then one person who I guess was deeply embedded in US, US history was like, oh, you should tie it to your power and politics class because <laughs> apparently Hamilton was like a power figure. He had like a very interesting path to power. And I was like, okay, we are making this happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, we submitted a proposal. The, uh, the administrators loved that idea, but they were like, you know, like, tickets are kind of expensive. <laughs> we'll be able to bring like literally two or three people. And we were hoping you could bring, you know, a few more students than that. And so <laughs> we ended up seeing Miss Saigon instead. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. So no Hamilton, unfortunately. I can't tell you more. Well, we'll we'll do a podcast in the future when you eventually, you know, the trajectory that you're on with your career, I'm sure there's going to be uh, uh, opportunities for that and to hear what came out of that. To, to shift it now into the research that you do, social inequality, status, power, hierarchies. These are your areas of expertise and This feels like you were made for the current moment, uh, particularly in the States right now. Now, a lot of this research, when we talk about inequality, tends to look at things from a very structural perspective, meaning systems, laws, et cetera, if I simplify it. You know, in your bio mentions that you look at social psychological forces. And can you just explain what that means in lay terms or give us an example of of how this plays out in your research that, that we can relate to and how that reproduces hierarchy and inequality? That's basically like just a fancy way of saying that I try to understand people's belief systems. You know, what do they believe about the world? And my interest has always been understanding, you know, what are people's beliefs and how do those beliefs affect the way they engage with others and the world more generally? So that's that's how I would summarize that. Okay. That fancy, that fancy sentence. Yeah. Yeah. So belief systems. I like that. It's very simple. And and what drew you there? And and then the the tie to inequality. So basically I, you know, I did my PhD at Stanford GSB and the organizational behavior group at Stanford consisted of both sociologists and social psychologists. And so I've always just been fascinated. My training has always been trying to understand like how people think about the world and how how their beliefs about the world influence their behavior and their engagement with the world more generally. And so, you know, I, I got really drawn into the study of inequality in part because of uh, my upbringing. So I grew up in the Philippines and my parents didn't really have that much. We didn't have a lot growing up. And so I've always just been curious about like, why is it that some families have a lot of wealth and power, whereas other families don't have a lot. And so that's always been sort of like 
a question at the back of my mind, and it's always just guided my research throughout uh, my career. And so this work on social class and, and how hierarchies um, reproduce themselves, this is what initially drew me, you know, because I coach around power and, and I, your, your research, your PhD, and then and subsequent articles that came out really attra- attracted me. And, and I wanted to kind of unpack this one idea that I thought was very interesting from your research. And what caught my eye here is looking at social class was that higher social classes individuals from that tended to be very confident or they grow up in privilege. Um, And so what we know is that when you're confident, you may come across as being perceived as more intelligent or confident, which may come through on a job interview, you're picked or whatever. And yet you may not have any more superior ability than someone from kind of a lower socioeconomic group who's more humble or feels like it's not their place. And so that seems like it can have these, and your research showed that it had these effects where hmm, higher class people seem to just step into things and take it or are rewarded for it. And those from lower backgrounds are not. So this kind of advantage begets advantage. Am I explaining that well? And and kind of what was the implications from from your research there? I appreciated that that nice summary of of the research because you're absolutely spot on. You know, to just give you, your your listeners, some context on this particular finding. So basically, my whole journey started when I was a PhD student at at Stanford GSB. And, you know, one day, Jeffrey Pfeffer, who was one of my advisors, uh, asked me if I wanted to be a TA for his class, which was a very popular elective called Paths to Power. And then on the very first day, like he walks in and basically tells us that everything that we've been told about power is a lie (laughs) that you know the world is not a fair place that hard work does not get you promoted and that was kind of like a shocking moment for me because i grew up with parents who are rice farmers in the philippines and the message that i've gotten throughout my life is you know just work hard and everything will manifest you know just keep your head down be humble be kind. And then here's Jeffrey Pfeffer telling us on the first day that, you know what, that's actually not what gets you ahead in organizations. And so, you know, that sort of class really prompted me to investigate, you know, like why, like, why is it, you know, like the world is structured the way it is. And it really prompted me to like examine more closely, you know, the role of our upbringing and the types of values and beliefs that we have. And so, you know, to your point, there is a lot of research showing like if you grew up in from a more humble background, you know, you kind of have a lot of emphasis on interdependence. And that basically means that, you know, your conception of being a good person is that you attend to others, you pay attention to their emotions, you are sensitive to the context. It's not just about you. And then if you grew up in a more, you know, middle class or upper middle class background, there's a lot of focus on independence, which is that the being a good person means like differentiating yourself from others, standing out, being a unique individual and, you know, focusing on your own goals and less so much on like the goals of the collective. And so that was sort of like the, you know, the, the larger story behind that research is that, you know, the kind of background that we have really does seem to uh, shape our definition of what it means to be a good person in the world. And something you just said there that, you know, if you're coming from a more humble or, or lower socioeconomic background, more communal. If we take this and we look at organizations, right, there is a lot of interdependency. So it would seem that those who are good at doing interdependent things or thinking of the the common good or the communal would actually be better at leading those organizations. Yeah, there's a lot of research showing that, you know, people who come from uh, working class backgrounds are actually very, very well suited to become leaders in organizations. So for example, there's some research by Michael Krauss and Dr. Keltner at UC Berkeley showing that uh, students who come from working class backgrounds are much more adept at reading the room. They're much more emotionally intelligent, which is of course a quality that we want in leaders. There is some research in sociology and education that a lot of people from working class backgrounds deeply care about social justice. And so, you know, they would make great change agents in organizations. There's also some research suggesting that, you know, people who are the first in their families to go to college or who tend to come from working class backgrounds 
they're risk takers, you know, um, they have this sort of like unique point of view, uh, they're willing to experiment. And so these are sort of like a lot of qualities that we want in leaders. And so point blank, why aren't they getting there then? Yeah, well, the, the, the well, there's one, there's just one challenge is that like this path to getting ahead in organizations, unfortunately, is very, very political, right? It's the, it's not, it's not just who is the best athlete. It's not just like who is the most hardworking person in the room, but there's a lot more factors that go into like who gets promoted in organizations. And for a lot of people who come from working class contexts, you know, playing the game or playing politics is something that's uncomfortable or something that they find distasteful as a function of how they grew up into, you know, values and lessons that they've learned, you know, from the cultures that they grew up in. Hmm. If they're good at reading the room or the kind of emotional intelligence, that would actually seem to be good for being able to do political behaviors. They just don't want to exercise those things is that kind of the yeah correct like i mean like they are much more adept at reading the room and are much more in- emotionally intelligent but the the idea of t- you you know taking that knowledge and using that knowledge to get ahead or you know to be more strategic about that information just seems a little icky for peeps for some people right and so yeah even though they're much more much, much better at empathizing with people and are actually much more emotionally intelligent. There's the question of like, well, what am I going to do with it, right? <laughs> and yeah. that's the, like, you know, for people like that, you know, using that information uh, to to get ahead just seems very inconsistent with their values and beliefs. So there's that inconsistency with values. And here, here comes really kind of the million dollar question, which, you know, I coach a lot of executives, I work with them and, I know that your research has a lot of implications about what organizations can do, improve their hiring policies, promotion policies, et cetera, because certain behaviors may be getting promoted in in organizations that are not ideal. But I want to concentrate our discussion here on what individuals can do if if they see your research and they they generally agree with it, right? I'm not willing to go in that political area because it violates my belief. What do they do? I mean, I'll give you an example like, you know, I'll have an executive who's, you know, a woman of color and she's rising up there. Her organization tends to be one where let's let's call it a bank, you know, dominant behaviors get rewarded. You know, you're more assertive, aggressive. In fact, those things feel icky to her. A lot of politicking going on. She recognizes there's bias and she's like, that's got to change. It's probably going to change in three years or longer, but I've got this window and I've got to show up at a meeting next week. Yeah. And, you know, it's this question of how do, how does she show up? Does she have to mimic some of those things that she sees? Base level here is what do individuals, what can they do on their own level yeah. to, to use some of your insights here to, to, to help them or, or, or to recognize this? What, what would you say? Absolutely. Like I always, I always get this question, right? Because I work a lot with, with first generation students here at UVA and also a lot of women, a lot of racial minorities who feel very uncomfortable with the idea of playing politics in order to get ahead. And I usually just like begin with a very basic and broad question, which is, well, why do you want to get ahead in the first place? Right. And I think that question like really stops people and, you know, they kind of like, yeah, I've never really thought about like why I want power. And the more you talk to them about it, then you kind of like see that people don't really have a clear goal of why they want to have power in the first place, because power just becomes this sort of like this word that captures a lot of things. Like for people, they, you know, they use power to mean that what they really want is success or happiness or living a meaningful life. And they, uh, that's all like, you know, and they describe those things and say that like, that's the reason why I want power, right? I always tell people like, well, if you want to be happy, if you're, if, the, if really the end goal is to be happy or live a meaningful life, you don't really need, necessarily need power to do that. You know, maybe like you should rethink your, your, uh, your strategy because if you just want to have a meaningful life, there's plenty of other ways to achieve that. You know, you could, 
uh, research shows that you could, you know, start a family and, you know, raise like good citizens in the world that, you know, that that's one way of achieving a meaningful life. For some people, they want to just say, really, at the end of the day, I just want to be happy. And I'm like, you can just get a dog <laughs> that's like, who will love you, you know, that's, you know, but, you know, but we have to be clear in the first place, you know, why you want power right because power is a very specific thing used in a very specific way right like you have to like figure out like why you want power in the first place if you have ambitions of like changing the world changing organizations making things better for everybody then you need power you've been listening to 97% effective with your host executive coach Michael Winderoth if this interview is making you think make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. If that's what you truly, truly want, then we'd have to figure out how you're, you're going to get there. But if the goal is something else, like happiness or living a meaningful life, there's there's plenty of ways to do that. And so what I find in my own research is that like asking people to be clear about, you know, why they want power is a very useful exercise. And then the second thing is that if people come from a disadvantaged background or if, you know, if they identify as a woman or as a racial minority or as a first-gen student, what I've often found to be useful is uh, helping them think about how power can be useful for the communities or the people that they care about. Because what I have found through my, in my own research is that because we are interdependent, you know, or because women or racial minorities or first-gen students are, tend to be very interdependent, right? What counts as a meaningful goal is if they can see that their actions will affect the lives of other people. So if you remind them about like how power can benefit not just only themselves, but also the people that they care about and the communities they care about or the social causes that they care about, then all of a sudden you're seeing that like, you know what, this, this battle, right? Me showing up in the workplace in a particular way, right? Isn't about me, isn't about my individual ambition isn't about like some individualistic selfish goal right this is something larger than myself right this is something that's like for the benefit of a collective and so helping people understand why they want power and like anchoring their goals into something that's larger than themselves is a very useful way uh, of, of of keeping people in the game i love those two pieces and if we take that example I was just mentioning, so if this executive is, you know, her goal is I want to affect change the way our company does hiring policies and new innovations that the company could launch in whatever her industry is. So if perhaps she's thinking about that end goal, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, may in some way justify the means like i've got to show up powerfully or this audience is not going to take me seriously yeah is it a little is it a little bit of the end if you frame it that way justify yeah. those means i think so i mean because you know it's like there are certain things that we wouldn't do right but for the people that we care about for the loved ones that, the, that we that we hold so deeply in our heart we would we're willing to do whatever it takes right and so I always just remind people that, you know, if you want to open doors for people like you, right, you have to be in a position of power to do that. I mean, sure, like you can enact the change that you want to be in the world and you can do that in a small scale. But if we're really, if, but if what you really deeply care about is enacting change on a large systemic structural level, then you need to be in a position of power to do that. And so... You know, I've always just found that a lot of the power skills that, you know, people learn in business schools, like how to show up in a powerful way or networking, those are easy, easy skills, right? Like it's it's easy to show up in a powerful way, you know, and just give you, a, if you have a couple of thousand dollars, you know, go shopping out there and you could fool people into thinking that you come from a very privileged background. But, you know, the reason why you want to do that and the reason why you want to behave in a powerful way, like those are the, th that's the deeper kind of, the deeper level of work that people need to be really working on. And so, you know, when you, when you frame your actions in a way that's consistent with, you know, the larger goal or the purpose that you're trying to achieve, then it, it makes, it makes it more, um, it makes it a more meaningful uh, exercise for, for that person. The, the other piece of this that I find 
working with executives and it comes through a lot is this fear if I were to, even if I've got these ends, you know, they justify, I need to show up powerfully. I do need to build a network um, to enable things to get done. And there is some research, or at least my understanding is some research out here that if you kind of repeatedly do some of these, you know, political behaviors or things they may not feel comfortable with that, and then they rise to power, that power also has this other effect where you become arrogant. You don't listen to other people. You become self-centered. Yeah. These selfish things that you're talking about, almost like, <laughs> you know, animal farm, right? And, you know, how does one prevent, like, suddenly the new group rises to power and then they become just like the other people, excluding others and not listening to others that they felt the previous group embodied? Like, how, how do you prevent yourself from going to the dark side, if I can just dumb it down a little bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I, I come at it in a very different angle because I subscribe to this view that power actually doesn't corrupt people, right? Power reveals. So what I mean by that is, you know, you take a person and you put them in a position of power and once they're no longer constrained by the social norms and they no longer have to follow the rules, then they will show you who they really are, Right. That's why I've always believed that like, if you really want to know people who they truly, truly are, like put them in a position of power, right? Because once they are no longer um, bound by the, by the norms of, of what they have to follow, then they will show you who they really are. And so this question of like, well, how do I get, you know, how do I not get corrupted? I think is kind of an interesting question because like, well, if you are, you know, to be blunt about it, if you are already an asshole, then we can't do anything about it. <laughs> you know, like once we put you in a position of power, like you are probably going to be more of an asshole, right? But uh, the research does show that if you are naturally much more inclined to help others, right, and be generous, uh, and be pro-social, then those people become even more of that when they are in a position of power. So I think I don't think necessarily that power corrupts. I think, you know, power just simply amplifies what's already there. Um, that said, I do think that engaging in certain actions do change people in some way, right? And my response to that is I don't think that you should fear that, you know, I think this notion that you know people say like oh I don't want to change like I don't want to be corrupted is kind of like uh, I I don't buy that because I don't believe that there is a true self right and, and what what I mean by that is like people say that like you know it's not who I am but like I always ask people like well who who's the real you right we're all like a work in progress is the real you the one uh, that your classmates at the GSBCU is your, you know, is the real you, uh, the one that you show up when you're at your parents is the real you, your five-year-old self. Like those are all parts of you and you should embrace all aspects of you. Right. And so this, this, I find that like when people say, like, I, you know, I, I fear of getting corrupted, what they really mean is that I don't want to change. And I find that to be, you know, to be just an excuse not to to learn and grow and develop and give yourself the grace of becoming the uh, the most complex and complicated version of you. So there's that. Uh, now that said, I think there are people who kind of get lost in their way as they move up in in power, and I think that is because uh, it's not really clear to them why they want power in the first place. You know, some people you can go back to my point earlier. Some people like go on this path uh, to power because they are looking for some sort of affirmation that they didn't have when they were a little child or they've, they're trying to cover up some pain or some embarrassment or some, some deep hurt that they have. And, you know, they're looking for power in order to sort of like feel good about themselves. And those are the types of individuals who I think if you don't know like why you're pursuing power, like you, you just get lost in the journey, right? Uh, but if you are very clear on like what the journey is and like you're clear and intentional about like why you're pursuing power, then there's, you know, a much, there's a reasonable chance that you'll stay, you know, grounded on the path. So it's doing a lot of introspective work around what really matters to you. I think that doing a lot of introspective work, but also just, you know, having a coach like you, <laughs> like, you know, talk to them about these things, right? Because, 
it, it's it, it it really helps if you have somebody who can help you see the world in a more objective way uh, because you know sometimes like you leave people into their own thoughts they come to the wrong conclusions right but yeah a lot of introspection but i would say like a lot of structured introspection with with somebody would be great yeah if you could name you know the biggest barrier that you feel like a lot of them them have with power what would you say that is i really do think that the biggest barrier that they have to power is themselves at the end of the day when i say that I do acknowledge that there are real structural barriers that prevent people from getting to the top, right? right. There's like, you know, I'm not going to deny that, you know, there's racism, there's sexism, there's classism, there's all sorts of things that go, you know, that pre- like really prevent people from getting to the top in spite of their best efforts and intentions. But I am of the belief that, you know, the world is an unfair place and we have to find peace with that idea. And, you know, we still have agency at the end of the day, and it is up to us to exercise that agency, given the constraints that we're facing. And so, you know, I I, I really do think that, you know, if you opt out of power, then that's it, right? And, but the thing here is that, you know, if you opt out of power, like, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as like you're making an intentional choice that you're opting out because it's clear to you that like you have other more meaningful goals that you want to pursue. But I think people should give themselves a shot. Yeah. Yeah. I did want to ask you because I noticed a new case study or exercise that that you that just came out that you put together with one of your colleagues around leading with vulnerability. And and I know that we're in a period where a lot of talk around authenticity, psychological safety. I think there's great research around there, and that is the goal. The question I wanted to ask, because it does come up with a a lot of of clients and executives out there is, hmm, you know, I'm going to go be vulnerable or share a lot of information about myself, but I've seen quite a few have that bite them totally on the ass because it gets used against them in some way. You never really, you know, wanted to get promoted. You know, you have this uh, stuff going on at home. So you, you know, we don't want to move you into that more senior role. Now, I I know that's not your message with the exercise, but how do people make sure you want to be vulnerable in some areas, but how do they kind of protect themselves from getting used against them? Yeah, yeah. Well, so we teach students how to lead with vulnerability because leading with vulnerability is just another tactic to acquire influence. Traditionally, there's two ways that you could think of of how to influence others. Like one would be to sort of, you know, in Deb Gruenfeld's lingo, you know, you could power up or play high, which is a tactic where you want to demonstrate your authority. You want to create some distance between you and your audience, right? And the goal is to like come across as very competent, right? And then there's another tactic, which would be, you know, playing low or powering down and this would be like leading with vulnerability and the goal is to draw others into us like highlight our warmth and make them make us appear that we're we're human right and just like any strategy like it's only effective if it's situationally appropriate you know like you probably don't want to go into a a meeting where like the expectation of you is that you will be commanding authority and then like in which case, if that is the expectation of you, if that is the role that you're supposed to play, then leading with vulnerability would totally backfire, right? And so to this question of like, well, how do you, you know, how do you make sure that like it won't be used against you? Like number one, like make sure that if you are leading with vulnerability, it is a situationally appropriate tactic. And then number two is that if you choose to go that route, make sure that uh, whatever you say, you're intentional about what 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 you're saying, why you're sharing what you're sharing, right? And don't be embarrassed about it. But the larger point is that it has to be a situationally appropriate tactic. You can't, you know, you can't just be crying <laughs> and being vulnerable at all times. And, you know, there's this, I think there's this notion that like, oh, if I open up and like I lead with authenticity and with vulnerability, like that will, you know, draw people in. Like, no, it's like, you can't, you can't do that because there are expectations that people have of you. And if the expectation is that you will command authority and rally the troops, then do that, you know. You know, and then there are moments when what 
the people need is to see you as, you know, as a warm, caring uh, human being, right? In which case, then leading with vulnerability would be appropriate to do that. I'm curious, as you talk about this, do some of your students or executives kind of say, hey, you're just telling us to kind of learn how to act <laughs> in <the> different <laughs> situations? And, uh, you know, because I sometimes talk about, you know, be a chameleon and then people feel like, ah, a chameleon that has no true self. But I, yeah. I know you touched on this, but it must be a power is obviously a, a sensitive topic right now. And to yeah. say, hey, be this in that situation. Does everyone accept that or what kind of uh, critiques do you get, you know, resistance from your students? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the I think I get a lot of critiques from uh, from students, especially American students. And I think that is because, you know, in the United States, there is this notion that there is a real self, you know, just underneath our layers, there's the real self, there's a unique you. <laughs> and, you know, the, that's, you know, that's not surprising to me, uh, because in, you know, the, in the United States, uh, there's that culture that dictates that, you know, all of us are like unique individuals, right? But in more, but students from more collectivistic cultures are actually do understand like what I'm saying, because mm. they understand that it's not just about you, right? There's, we all play different roles in different situations. Like in one situation, I am a brother or a sister or in another situation, I am a classmate. In another situation, I am a daughter or a son. In another situation, I am a manager or a boss. And we're all playing different roles and we all have to bring truth to our role, right? And the most important part for people in these cultures is that we all play our roles authentically, right? Like we're all characters on a stage and, you know, if one of us deviates from the script, then, you know, society will not function, Right. And so, yes, I do get pushback from individuals, especially if they come from cultures that emphasize that there is this real self that's buried underneath them. But what, what I always tell people is that like, that's, you know, that is an idea uh, that you were, you were uh, told and it, it makes sense in this particular culture. But if you actually look at how we function in society, we're really, really interdependent, right? And we're playing all different roles and we have different goals in every situation and we must cater to what the situation calls for, right? Yeah. You, you've been now at, at UVA since I think 2015, 2016, which means you've got, you know, course alumni who have now, you know, five to seven years out into their careers. And, you know, do you have one or two examples that you could share of, of folks who maybe had that resistance came in to your course and, uh, you know, took some of those strategies or that reframing and have, have used it in, in interesting ways? Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember a couple of women that I work with on my first year here at Darden Business School. And, you know, one of them said that I can't do any of the stuff that you teach me here because, like, I'm a woman, blah, blah, blah. And then she went to, did an internship at uh, Microsoft and she was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to try. <laughs> I'm just going to try like, you know, putting some of these like power skills to, to work, you know? And so she, you know, she was in her internship and she, you know, she liked the group that she, uh, she was in, but she really wanted to be in a different area of Microsoft. And so she uh, networked internally, sent out a bunch of emails to people, um, had, you know, coffee chats with that particular group that she wanted to be in, uh, while at the same time keeping like her relationships positive in the group that she was working for. Uh, I don't know if she actually did the work <laughs> that she was supposed to do, but, you know, she was networking with the managers and, you know, managing up really well. So, so everybody loved her. And then like one coffee chat led to another. And then basically she had found herself into a meeting with, you know, the big boss in that group. And, you know, she did some research about the big boss and it turns out that she and the big boss liked certain things and so she played up that similarity and then they were like, you know what, like, we don't really have an opening right now, but we love you so much. We're going to make this offer to you anyway. <laughs> so, you know, a few weeks later, she uh, got an offer from this new group. They literally created a position for her. 
to be in that in that group and so she decided that you know i was like and so she emailed me she's like i don't know what to do because now i have an offer from this <laughs> this uh area that i was supposed to be an intern in and then she has like a competing offer uh, elsewhere in microsoft and um yeah and so she literally created something out of nothing so yeah <laughs> and so you started this by saying power skills and as you were describing what she did, networking, being creative, being very proactive, yeah. when, you, when you hear power skills, most people think Machiavellian, yeah. you know, things that people are doing behind their backs or superhuman things. But they seem to like that's going from kind of letting things take its course to being very strategic or intentional about certain things that she did. Is that, I mean, when you're teaching power skills, are those these skills or, or what are the, the key skills here that, that propel you or propelled her here? Yeah. Well, a couple of things, you know, there's two parts to it. Like one part of it would be developing personal qualities that build power. Some of that would be like cultivating ambition, having boundless energy. Confidence is another big one, right? So that's like one component of like, you know, um, uh, developing power. And then there's also uh, the component of making sure that you position yourself strategically in the organization that you're in. So networking skills would be one of those things, right? Making sure that you are central in your networks, making sure that you have a very broad, connective and very diverse network uh, is another is another one. And it, I think like I, a lot of it too is just like relationship management, you know, um, but I think that one of the things that I often tell students is that at the end of the day, like you are really not responsible for your career, you know, and, and, you know, people are like have a hard time understanding what that means. And I always tell people that your manager at the end of the day, you know, is responsible for your career and your one job is to get those people excited about you. Right. Because like in organizations, what we have to remember is that we don't get promoted because we've done everything we're supposed to do. You know, that just because there's a checklist that's given to us, like if you've done like, you know, check, 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 you know, now promote me. Like that's not how it really works. Right. You know, you get promoted because there is somebody who says, you know what, we love Michael and we're going to let Michael move up. Right. Somebody has to make a decision about you. Right. And your job is to find those people and get them excited about you. Right. It's finding the gatekeepers, like finding the sponsors, finding the person who is going to be in that room, pounding the table and say, you know what, Michael, we love this person. Let him move up. Right. And, and your job is, is, is to find those people and get them excited. Yeah. I love that. Your job is to find these people and get them excited. And yeah, that's that's it in a, nut, in a nutshell. Um. Yeah. Well, because, you know, if you think about it too, is that like you, you know, you can end up in like the most, in, in the best team, in doing the best job for the best organization that you could possibly hope for, right? But if the gatekeepers there are not excited about you, it's probably not going to happen, right? There's a lot of the importance of of finding sponsors is is really, really critical, you know. And I always tell people like your ambition, your ambition will not pull you up, but somebody else will. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. And so I want to end with two questions, Peter. And well, the first one is to kind of pull us back to the beginning because we ended here. You talked about these power skills which again, are not these Machiavellian things, thinking about it's other people that promote you. You start, I don't know if you still do, at least I found it online, your, your course with this, which I alluded to in the introduction of this Filipino fashion blogger, uh, Brian Boy, I think is, yeah. is his name. And I went and looked at some of the blog posts, at least an initial one. I was like, whoa, <laughs> it is profanity laced, really shocking, get attention. And I imagine, so there's this piece around building influence there. What, what's the, we're, we're kind of starting your course and you're getting to challenge people to think about influence, but what is the purpose of that, that case and, and how does that land with people? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, I love teaching Brian Boy for a couple of reasons. Like number one, he's just like a very interesting 
funny person. And I think there's a lot to be learned about from that case. One of the things that I think Brian Boyd did really well in his career is that he was a first mover. You know, like I think that, you know, he was doing a lot of this outrageous stuff on the internet before we had YouTube or Instagram or social media. He was doing a lot of this stuff, you know, that got him noticed uh, even before now. Now we have like a million influencers and TikTokers and I can't distinguish right. them from each other, right? But Brian and Boy's case really is an example of somebody who uh, was, you know, a first mover in a space. And that's something that, that we all have to think about, you know, when we are thinking about our own path to power, you know, because one of the things they tell our MBA students is that 95% of you will go to an investment bank or, you know, will go to consulting. And there's an upside to that, you know, you get the prestige, it's a traditional path, right? But the downside of this is that it will be much harder for you to differentiate yourselves from your competition because there's literally thousands of you who can do exactly the same thing, right? And the first rule of power, or I guess like one of the many first rules of power is that in order for you to move up, you first have to stand out and get noticed, right? And so Brian Boy like really carved, was very courageous in like carving out his own path and doing what nobody else was doing at that time and got noticed for it. And, and as a result of that, like he was able to build this, you know, this this career, this this, this self fulfilling career. You know, his his background is really interesting because, you know, his online persona is actually not like what you know what who he really was. But because of what he did, like people now like just think of him as like this the online persona. The the online persona in him is like one. So that's one lesson uh, of that case. And then of course, like there's all of the other things that he did uh, throughout his career that just like exemplifies the rules of power. You know, he always showed up in a powerful fashion. He knew the right people. He knew how to flatter people. You know, he knew how to make people feel good. You know, um, he was, you know, he was always, um, he was always a talk of the town, you know, through his social media posts, you know, and again, like this was, at the time when like, you know, social media was just, was just booming. Right. So lots of things about in there, but I, and I guess like the one last thing about Brian Boyd that I think is, you know, a good reminder for, for all of us is that, you know, most people will read the case and it's written in a way that like will make you like feel very turned off about this person. You're yeah. Just, just hate this person. <laughs> just like, I don't love this person. Like I think this, this person is disgusting. I don't love that. Like, how he like rose to power. And I guess like, you know, I, it's an invitation for, for my students to be less judgmental about, you know, about the world, you know, Jeffrey Pfeffer had this great, you know, lesson for all of us when I was at Stanford that, you know, judgment is the one of the few things that really impedes people from getting power because once like you're very judgmental about somebody, you stop learning from them. Right. And what we really need to do in order to become powerful is to become very clinical and very open to the experience, right? We need to like sort of like look at what people are doing and then think about like, how can I, how can I apply those lessons into my own personal context, right? And so, you know, I, I, I this is an invitation. So the Brian Boyd case is an invitation for the students to sort of practice a lot of like this the stuff that we talk about in the power class, but also like from a meta perspective, like it's an invitation for them to like be less judgmental about things. Being leg- less judgmental, probably something we need more right now in a very polarized uh, society where people aren't talking to each other. But that is another yeah. larger, <laughs> larger topic to open. Yeah, to- absolutely. So, 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 Peter, you are at uh, UVA. Um, you do a lot of research. You publish. Also, are quoted widely in the popular press. How do people best see your work? But what's the best way to to be looking and seeing what you're doing? Um, well, they could just email me. You know, I'm just if if you can provide the my email contact information to your listeners. You know, that's the best way to mm-hmm. you know to to reach me. I try to have a zero inbox policy. So, so Peter. Thank you so much for your time today and a very interesting discussion as we dove into this and keep producing the research. I've been benefiting from it and so have my clients. So I'm glad that we can share that more widely to the world here. Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope the next time you will have lots of Filipino food already. (laughs) I'm going to right after this go (laughs) Google search for Madrid now that we can get out. Oh my God. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Awesome. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.